Good evening to the Sulphur Well Church. My name is Mark Hurt. I've gotten to be with you the last couple of years anyway in your Wednesday night summer series. So it's good to be able to be with you again this year. But man, this certainly is different, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I am certainly growing weary of video uh, messages and video presentations and video worship assemblies and Zoom meetings and all of this stuff. But it's good to be able to be with you, even if it is in this way. I know that God is at work in our world, even though that's sometimes really hard to see. Uh, despite everything that is happening with the COVID-19 pandemic, with all of the um, protests regarding Black Lives Matter and the, the rethinking of the value of all of human life, um, God is certainly at work in our midst in, in these tumultuous circumstances to hopefully bring us to a higher level of connection with one another and with him. So I'm glad to be able to be with you tonight. I'm sitting in um, my office at the University Church building in Murray. Um, my role uh, in, in work has changed a little bit since I was with you last. Um, I'm, I'm not really here anymore. Um, I have an office here. Those are my books on the shelf behind me. There's a few books on shelves either side of me, but I don't spend much time here these days. Um, I have transitioned into full-time counseling, so I now work with a counseling organization out of Paducah in both Paducah and Murray offices, uh, focusing primarily on issues of a spiritual nature and um, substance abuse. So that occupies a lot of my time these days, but just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, and who knows if I'm with you again next year, I'm sure situations will have changed again by then. So I'm speaking to you tonight uh, from Mark chapter seven, beginning with verse 31. So I'm going to read this text and then offer um, offer some observations about it. If you have a Bible like mine, um, there's a heading above this section that says, Jesus heals a deaf and mute man. The story is also found in Matthew chapter 15. That's the parallel passage, Matthew 15, verses 29 through 31. And as you might imagine, those three verses are a little bit shorter than the story we find here. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephaphatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. A couple of observations about this story. Um, there, there is a story ahead of it. Um, there are several stories ahead of it, actually. But it's often connected with the story that comes before it, where Jesus honors the faith of a Syrophoenician woman. Um, it's in the same region. Um, his presence could not be kept secret. There is a woman who has heard about Jesus whose daughter was possessed and she came and she fell at his feet. Jesus basically says to her, um, let the children eat all they want for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. 
Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then Jesus said, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. So these two stories are connected. They're connected in a couple of ways. And hopefully that, that will be uh, more evident as, as I'll work through this with you. Um, both of them are bigger than the literal story. Um, the older that I get, um, the more I come to see that there are texts in the Bible, there are stories in the Bible that have really multiple dimensions to them. They're almost like uh, a gem. Not that I have any experience with gemology, but I've been told. If you take a, a gem and, and, and you turn it, and every different way that you turn it, as the light shines through it, it reflects something different or maybe refracts something different. That might be the right term. Everywhere you turn it, there's a different angle. There's a different look. There's a different light that shines forth from it. And that's the way a lot of passages of scripture are. Um, we do ourselves a great disservice when we limit our interpretation of scripture to one meaning. And, and our problem is we usually focus on what is the most literal. And when we do that, we tend to make things the main point of the story that weren't intended to be the main point, And we end up missing the main point. Um, and so, for example, the story that I read first tonight, people want to look at that and they want to say, well, why did Jesus have to do this? Why did Jesus stick his fingers in his ears? And why did Jesus have to, to spit? And why do you have to touch the man's tongue? What are all these details about? Let's just get to the gist, okay? Um, but all this is here for a reason. These stories are all connected for a reason, and they're connected to the stories that come before them for a reason. You see, Mark is, he's sort of known as the rapid fire gospel writer. Um, he is very fast paced. There's nothing slow about Mark. Um, he gets his message in within 16 chapters. It's very succinct. And so, and so Mark is working toward a very specific goal. The goal toward which he's working is going to be found in chapter 8, where Peter makes the confession that Jesus is the Messiah. Everything in Mark's story is leading up to that confession in chapter 8. And then after that confession in chapter 8, the rest of Mark's story builds from, takes off from that point. And so, and, and not coincidentally, that's roughly the halfway point of Mark's gospel. So everything is leading up to that. And then everything after that comes after that. Um, and so there are a series of miracle stories in Mark's gospel that lead up to Peter's confession. And, and these are essentially the last two in that series. Now, there, there's still the feeding of the 4,000 as, as chapter 9 begins, but it's a little bit different. It's not a healing miracle. So there are a series of, of, of miracles that Mark is presenting to the reader, to his audience, that are going to make the case for that which Peter will confess a few pages over. Okay, with me so far? Okay, um, the man that's brought to Jesus is one who, my version says, was deaf and could hardly talk. An unfortunate translation of this word, it's a word that only appears twice in the entire Greek Bible, and it's a word that means the man spoke indistinctly. Doesn't mean that he couldn't speak at all. And some of the older English translations will, will translate this word as deaf mute. And so we get the idea that he could not hear. In addition to that, he could not speak at all. He was, he was mute. But that's really not what the word means. He could speak, 
but he spoke indistinctly. Um, Jesus was a healer. Um, he was a healer. He was one who made people whole, one who made people well. Um, this is all a part of Mark's message of the kingdom of God being at hand or the kingdom of God being present. It is, it is the point of Mark to his readers that what was occurring in Jesus, what was happening with Jesus was this kingdom reign of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is present. And so we'll talk more about that in just a minute. The characteristic of, of Mark's gospel is this, it's been called this messianic secret, this idea that you don't tell anyone. Now, this is another one of the details that, that people tend to perhaps overemphasize in their, in their study of Mark. They've even given it its own name. Um, for anybody to speculate as to why Jesus continually requested that people not tell about what he had done for them is speculation because we don't know. We don't know for sure why he said that. And there are lots of ideas out there. Probably the most, uh, the most reasonable to me is the idea that the general public wasn't ready. Um, the general public wasn't ready for this news of the eschatological reign of God, this news about the kingdom of God and what that really meant. Um, certainly the religious establishment, they were not ready for the message that Jesus came to proclaim. Certainly the religious establishment aligned with the empire, aligned with the government of Rome. Um, the Jewish leaders and Rome were in cahoots together. And so there were, there were so many ways in which the society and the culture just wasn't ready for the message that Jesus truly had. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, Jesus was all about the outcast. The fact that he would um, grant healing to the daughter of a Gentile in the previous story. Um, the fact that he would spend his time with a man that had been born deaf and was unable to speak clearly. The people that Jesus spent time with were those on the margins, those on the edge. And, and, and the religious establishment didn't really want anything to do with, with those people. Certainly Rome didn't care anything about that class of people, but that's who Jesus spent his time with. Um, and so the powers that were, the powers that be, that they weren't, they weren't prepared for that. They, they weren't, they weren't ready for someone who might stir up revolution among, among the poor. And Jesus also had a message that was different from the religion of his day. Um, when Jesus came on the scene and he said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand or repent for the kingdom of God is near. Depending on what translation you read, uh, th those terms are, are largely used uh, interchangeably. Um, when Jesus came talking about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, he was not talking about a military overthrow of Rome. That's what most people living in the first century were looking for. They wanted God to come onto the scene and to restore the earthly kingdom to Israel. They wanted to uh, drive out Rome. They wanted their rightful place, so they thought, as God's people reinstituted in the world. And, you know, if you think about it, the Bible is a book written by oppressed people, produced by an oppressed nation, and um, Israel was always oppressed from the time of Egypt, uh, Persia, Assyria, Babylon. Um, they were 
virtually captives, slaves, oppressed people for most of their history. Now it's Rome. And so when someone comes talking about the kingdom of God or the, 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 the kingdom of heaven come down from God, the idea was largely present that this was going to be a military governmental overthrow of the earthly establishment of the earthly government, the earthly empire. That was not what Jesus was talking about. In fact, when he says repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand or the kingdom of God is near. We tend to think of the word repent referring to sorrow, being sorry for action. Um, that's not what he's talking about. The word literally means to change your mind or better to change your way of thinking. Now, I've heard it defined as a change of heart followed by a change of mind or a change of mind followed by a change of heart, depending on which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Um, but the word is better defined as change the way you think. So when Jesus says repent, he says change the way you think about the kingdom of God. Change the way you think about God's reign, about God's rule, about this kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven. Change the way you think about it because it's not what you think. It's not a kingdom of power and prestige and military might. It is a kingdom of love and compassion and grace and mercy, most especially to those who are denied in this present system. When Jesus came and said, the kingdom of God is here, the good news of that pronouncement was that it is now for everybody. Nobody's left out. Now, in God's economy, nobody ever had been left out. It was Israel that had chosen to draw lines of exclusivity. Um, and if we're not careful, we can draw lines of exclusivity today. God always provided for the alien, the foreigner, the oppressed, and the outcast. Always. And it was the people of Israel who clouded a lot of that. So God's heart has always been there. Scripture always upholds that group of people. The last, Jesus said, shall be first. And those who are first shall be last. Those that have the worst seat at the banquet table will be brought to the head of the table. And those who are at the head of the table will be asked to sit at the foot of the table. So there's always this sense of divine reversal. And Jesus came to exemplify that, to embody that, to show that to the people of his day. So when he says, change your mind, change the way you think, about the kingdom of God, because it is not a military power. It is not a governmental power. It is the power of the God that created all things, who is connected to all things, who loves all things. And it is now available to you who have up to this point been deprived. That's what makes it good news. If that's not true, then it's not good. If the gospel is not true for everybody, then it's not good news. It's not good news. The second thing about this kingdom message that Jesus taught was that it is now. It is present. It's not some future. It's not some off in the distance somewhere. It's not up in the sky in the sweet by and by. Not when we all get to heaven. It's, 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 not, it's not the hope of a place that will go when we die. When Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand or the kingdom of heaven is near or the kingdom of heaven is in your midst, he's talking about right then, right then and there. So you and I are in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God right here, right now. And it, it's not, it's not. It's not defined by any building or any group of buildings 
or any certain group of believers. That's not how God defines the kingdom. What God says is the way that God wants us to exist in all of eternity is present, is available in in some measure right now. So when you and I made a decision to turn our wills and our lives completely over to the care of God, when we acknowledged our dependence upon God and our willingness to follow Jesus in baptism, we became a part of this already but not yet movement. There is a sense in which we are already in the kingdom of God. We are already to be demonstrating the life that is ruled by a new king, by a new emperor, by a new leader. And that ruler, that emperor, that leader is God, exemplified in the person of Jesus. That's who we follow. And and we follow him now. Listen, folks, if, if, if being a follower of Jesus doesn't give me some peace and some serenity now, what good is it? If I can look at the world around me, if I can watch the news, not too much news, mind you, and see everything that has happened in the year 2020, if, if if the rule and the reign of God doesn't make a difference in our world today, then what good is it? What good is it? I'll give you a minute to think about that. If being a follower of Jesus, if 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 turning my turning my life over to God, if following Jesus in baptism, if all of those things are just fire insurance for me, if all of those things are just things that I do so that I can go someplace else when I die, and how I live here and now is eh, be nice to be a good person, be nice to go to church some on Sundays, maybe Wednesday night when they start them back up. These Zoom things, I don't have to do that. I may send a check in, I may not. I mean, you get my point, right? Being a follower of Jesus has to make a difference in my life today and in the way that I treat other people today. And it has to make a difference in your life and in the way that you treat other people and in the way that we treat one another. And if if enough of us treat each other in those ways, That's what changes the world. Yes, pandemics hopefully can get our attention. Yes, police brutality can certainly get our attention. Protest marches should certainly get our attention. And I believe God is at work in in, in all of that. But the most powerful tool that I have is me. It's my own graciousness. It's my own love. It's my own kindness. It is my own compassion. So if you want to march in a protest march, you go for it. But I would challenge you to look for somebody of black or brown skin color and get to know that person. Listen to their story. Build a relationship and see how you can be a part of the solution instead of being part of a society that has generated much of the problem. That's the kingdom of God that Jesus came to talk about. Now, some overall comments, and then and then I'll wrap this up. Um, it's a shame you don't have any chance to question me, or maybe that's great. Um, we, we don't have any chance to dialogue or, or ask a question, and I doubt there's even a space below this video where you can leave a comment. And that might be a good thing too. Um, but both of these both of these stories have something to do with what is clean versus what is unclean. Um, the story of the Syrophoenician woman, and even the story of, of the man who was deaf and could hardly talk. Um, they both have something to do with this 
this clean versus unclean um, controversy that began chapter 7. Um, these two stories especially exemplify the teaching of Jesus. It, it, it didn't matter to Jesus if something was ceremonially clean or unclean. Most of the people that Jesus touched would have been considered unclean. And that's just who Jesus was. You know, I need to do a better job of, of touching the unclean. You know, I can present a lesson like this. And man, it's real easy to do this, you know, on a video. I don't have to even see you face to face. I certainly don't have to touch you. I don't have to shake your hand or, you know, do the, do the, the COVID-19 fist bump. I don't even have to interact with you at all. Kind of sad. We miss a lot. I certainly miss a lot by not being able to be there with you. But Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus went and touched the very people that were considered untouchable. Those were the people that he hung out with. I am convinced that if Jesus of Nazareth were on this earth today, he would be marching in protest to the establishment of oppression. I just believe that he would. I believe those are the people that he would hang out with. I believe that Jesus would hang out with the people in the bars who are there for the last call at 3 a.m. who don't have anywhere to go when the bar closes. I believe that Jesus would hang out with those who are confused about their sexuality, who don't really know who they're, who they're supposed to love, who they love, who, they, who they've been told they're supposed to love, I think Jesus would be right there in the midst of the LGBTQ community and he would say, I love you and I care about you and I'm here to give you touch. Jesus would hang out at tattoo parlors. Jesus would hang out at the country clubs, but he'd probably be at the country clubs. He'd probably be at the church houses. He'd probably be at the financial institutions much like he visited the temple the last week of his life. And that's what got him killed. So these stories show the kind of person that Jesus was. He touched the unclean. The idea of the messianic secret. Um, why it's there, who knows. Put that on your list of questions to ask when you get to heaven. And you can ask it. Somebody will know the answer and it will probably surprise you of how little significance there is to it. Um, but then this idea that this closing accolade that, that he has done all things well. Um, there's a quote there from Isaiah, I believe Isaiah chapter 35. And, and this points to um, God's extraordinary power. It points to the witness of God's extraordinary work um, and the kingdom of God and its fulfillment through Jesus. Um, it signifies the presence of, of, of God and the presence of the kingdom of God in that moment. You know, one of the best things that can be said about anybody is that he's done all things well. Um, you probably don't hear that compliment given to hardly anybody today. And, and I, I do have to wonder if, if it were given, would it be given in the biblical sense? Um, but that statement drives home the point that Jesus is the initiator. He is the one who is ushering in this new age, this new reign this 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 new way of life for those that would choose to follow it it's radically different it's radically different from the system of the established religion it was radically different from the system of the established empire it's radically different from anything the world has to offer it is a life of loving one another it is a life of touching the untouchable it is a life of serving one another with graciousness and with mercy and with compassion. It is about doing all things well. Jesus was a healer and Jesus was a teacher. 
wherever Jesus went, he brought healing touch. And the healing touch wasn't necessarily just about the cure of a physical malady. I want you to listen to me carefully. The healing touch was not just about the cure of a physical malady. The healing touch brought about that which enabled the untouchable to become touchable once again. That's how Jesus healed. And then Jesus was a teacher. The things that Jesus taught had to do with the goodness of God, the love of God, and the compassion of God for all people. This is what made Jesus different from anybody else that ever had been, that there ever was, and that there ever will be. God's love is for everybody. It is exemplified in Jesus of Nazareth. It is available to you. It's available to me. It's available to people with yellow skin or red skin or brown skin or black skin. And, and honestly, the more, the more in the role of the oppressed that, that one finds themselves, the closer they are to the heart of God. So may we all seek to touch someone this week that we might have previously identified as untouchable. May we seek to build relationships with people that are different from us, with whom we never might have sought out an intentional relationship before. May we carry the good news of God's grace and love and mercy and compassion for every single human being throughout everything that we do. May we demonstrate God's connection with all of us, with all of humanity, and may we demonstrate our connection with one another. And may grace and peace and God's presence be with you, Sulphur Well Church family, every step of the way. Thank you.